everybody, welcome to another episode of the podcast where it is my job to sit down with experts in their field to learn the knowledge and skills to help us live the best life possible. Now this episode is all about empathy. I sat down with Dr. Rachel Hannum, who is the director of Northside Brisbane Psychology. She has so much knowledge in this area and she was so generous with her time and we had such a great chat, chatting about all things empathy. She also gave us some really practical ways that we can develop empathy in our own lives and also why it's important. So I'm really excited to share this one with you guys. As always, I know it's gonna add a ton of value to your life. Empathy is something that is so important for each and every one of us. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel so that you're always notified when new episodes come out. And don't forget to leave a comment letting me know what you got out of this, what you enjoyed about it, and also just to help us all grow together as a community. But that's enough from me, so please enjoy this episode with Dr. Rachel Haddam. Rachel, it's great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Rich. Let's, uh, for anybody listening or watching, let's give them sort of a, a brief rundown of who you are and, and what you do, if that's all right with you. Yeah, sure. So uh, Rachel Hannam is my name. I am the director of North Brisbane Psychologists here in Brisbane. Um, I see clients as a, as a counselling psychologist in a clinical setting. The other way in which I um, work as a psychologist is in workplaces. So I go into corporate settings and government settings uh, and I conduct uh, a range of psychological services, including training and facilitation and, and mediation and conflict management surf services um, where I mediate um, disputes uh, in an attempt to get a resolution between, you know, managers and employees. And, um, yeah, and I, and I love doing that. I also have my own podcast called Help Me, I'm a Comedian. So, um, yeah, I'm Everybody pretty passionate about check that. that out. Yeah, yeah, it's um, on the uh, ABC website. And I'm pretty passionate about this topic. So thank you for having me. No worries. Thanks for being here. So empathy, I guess we should kick straight into it. What is empathy? <laughs> So you'll find various definitions out there of the word empathy, but my simple working definition is a genuine interest in somebody else's experience, a genuine interest in their feelings and their needs is my simple working definition. Um, there's different types of empathy and we can get into that, but I think if you're genuinely interested in knowing another person's inner world, that's empathy. Mm. So kind of putting putting yourself in their shoes, putting trying to see the world through their eyes is what you mean by seeing the, seeing them that way. Yeah, yeah. And, and these different types of empathy um, become important when you start looking at a definition of empathy um, because part of empathy but not the whole thing is perspective taking. So what you just said, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, is being able to s- is an attempt, a genuine attempt to try and see through another's eyes. Imagine how they are experiencing a situation. This becomes very important when I do couples counselling, as you can imagine, and mm. also when I'm mediating disputes in the workplace. Um, but trying to understand another person's perspective is only one part of empathy. Yeah, cool. So I can see why that would be super important for couples counselling. You know, even my my wife and I, for instance, there's definitely times where she's doing something that I can go, oh, and I I know I do this to her as well. But you're going, what is? Why is she doing that? Like, why would she think that way? But it's been the times where I've kind of had to go, why? Why actually would she be thinking that way? Or is she acting in that way? That I go most of the time, I'm fine that. Oh, that makes perfect sense. There's a there's a reason that she's doing that, but yeah, that's super important. And so that's one. Is that one type you said? And so there's another type as well. Well, I, I would say perspective taking is one component of empathy. Um, and it, you know, it's really easy to say, you know, try and put yourself in someone else's shoes. But you mentioned your wife. You know, it's um, 
you know, and, and all couples that I work with, this, this is super important, but it's not always easy, is it? Because mm. you have to understand their personality and how it's different to yours. You have to understand a bit about their childhood and their background and why certain things might be triggering for them that don't bother you or vice mm. versa. Um, so even though perspective taking is only one part of empathy, even perspective taking has quite a few kind of components to it. Um, another component of empathy so perspective taking is what we could call cognitive empathy. So that's okay. you know probably the broadest um, category there with regards to perspective taking. We'll come back to cognitive empathy. The other major component of, of empathy is affective empathy or emotional empathy. So this is the kind of empathy that that children have. You know, children aren't necessarily very good at perspective taking, mm. but we've probably all seen children who feel very sad when they see something sad on television or in a movie, mm. or if they know that mum or dad is struggling, you know, they kind of pick up on that and they feel it. So emotional empathy is where we are affected at an emotional level by seeing someone else in pain. And it can be the simplest thing. You know, have you ever seen someone whack their head really hard and you go like this? Have yeah, you ever done yeah, that? definitely. For sure. Yeah. Well, that means you have empathy. Right? If, oh, well, that, well, that's a good. We're, we're, we're onto something. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. If you saw someone whack their head really hard and you didn't flinch, then I'd be worried you're a psychopath. <laughs> mm. Is you that know, something like this may be going down a little tangent, but when you said psychopath, is that something that, you know, is, is common, I guess, with are there people that just genuinely don't feel empathy? Yeah, so this, good question, this emotional empathy, which is, you know, you see someone hit their head really hard and you go, oh, or you see someone yawn and if you're a bit tired, you yawn as well, right? Mm. This is uh, a, an automatic response from a part of our brain called our emotional mirror neuron network. So okay. sort of through this part of our brain, we have these mirror neurons which get activated when we see someone else having, um, you know, a joyful experience or a painful experience. And we feel a bit of that as well. Mm. So we think that the messages that would go from this part of the brain to the central part of the brain, the emotional part of the brain, that the linkages between those different parts of the brain that make us flinch, that make us yawn, that make us feel someone else's pain, those linkages don't work very well in a small okay. percentage of the population. And that this could be the, um, sort of neurological basis for things like psychopathy and sociopathy, you know, people who are low on empathy and, and other, other people who also test low on empathy, the, the theory is they don't have the linkages in their brain that are needed for us to mm. pick up on other people's feelings and experiences. Um, but having this affective empathy on its own is, is not necessarily enough because what can actually happen in people who are very high on affective empathy or emotional empathy is something called hyper empathy. Okay. You know, these are the discussions you see about, can you have too much empathy? Mm. You know, they, they pop up online from time to time without the cognitive empathy, without being able to think about feelings, um, you, and in fact, learning cognitive empathy skills is sort of an antidote for both low empathy and super high empathy, because you can see how both can be a problem. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, def definitely. Yeah. What would be some of the, the problems with like high empathy? Is that just, I'm um, like, uh, is that just, you're feeling way too much towards that and that you you don't, you're not doing anything with your own life. You're just constantly empathetic. Would that be a, is that what we mean by high empathy? Yeah. Yeah. So there is this term, uh, it's not in the diagnostic manual or anything, but you will come across it online if you search it, hyper empathy. And most people might be familiar with the term empath. You know, an empath is someone who's, mm. who's very high on empathy. Um, you know, and there's various problems that can result from that. One is that if you're in any kind of helping profession or if you're someone who just has a lot of friends with problems, you know, you, you can burn out from taking mm. on board yeah, other definitely. people's emotional experiences, right? And it's, you know, it's very tricky if someone's a psychologist, a social worker, a police officer, a nurse, a teacher, you know, and they've got this mm. excessive amount of empathy. 
um, because if someone's depressed, they feel depressed. If someone's anxious, they feel anxious. They sort um, of take all that weight on themselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, it's burnout territory if if people don't kind of figure out a way to to manage this. And I think it happens because people, for whatever reason, and there's usually reasons that we can go back and figure out, they over-identify with other people and, and their pain um, and, and they don't have good boundaries and they're not very good at differentiating between my pain and your pain mm. and, and sort of knowing that they're different. My story is my story. Your story is your story. I can have empathy without drowning, you know, in, in your pain. It's tricky. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, mm. that would be that would be a super tricky place to be in for sure if you're that. If you're somebody who has low empathy, can can you learn to be more empathetic? Is that something or you kind <clears> of <throat> just is that inbuilt to us? Yeah, so because of this emotional empathy which seems to be fairly inbuilt and starts at a young age, we can say that some people naturally have higher or lower amounts of empathy, but this cognitive empathy is something we can definitely learn. Mm. This is, you know, a, a psychological skill set. And so if people are lower on empathy, there's plenty that they can do to build their cognitive empathy and cognitive empathy is not to be sneezed at. You know, some people who may have low levels of empathy naturally, but who are very good at communicating and very good at showing genuine interest in other people's inner experiences can still provide an enormous amount of support to others without, you know, necessarily feeling a lot. Yeah, not necessarily taking, you're not necessarily taking it all on, but you are feeling and putting seeing yourself through the lens of the life of that person for sure. Exactly. Exactly. And in fact, there's some research and I'm just going to have a quick look at uh, the summary. I prepared some research with medical students um, that was done to see if they could increase their empathy scores, including their uh, subjective experience of empathy. So how much empathy they felt. Mm. Um, And so they did a few different things with these med students. They, um, they put them in direct patient contact uh, situations. So they were talking to patients about their problems. They got them to role play being a patient, so sort of seeing it from the other side. The third thing they did was actually expose the medical students to literary and performing arts. So they got them to see more plays and read more books, which yeah, have right. high yeah. emotional yeah, high emotional content. This is where I think the creative arts are actually a really important part of our culture because they promote perspective taking and empathy. You know, when you read books, see movies, um, sure. you might be putting yeah, putting yourself in other people's shoes. They taught them communication skills for empathy. They taught them stress management skills. And they also gave them role models who were high on empathy. And when they did those very targeted interventions with the medical students, uh, after a few months, most of them scored higher on empathy, which is interesting. Mm. So it's definitely something that you can, that cognitive empathy is definitely something that you can really train like anything else that you would train, isn't it? You expose yourself to the right pressures and forces. You're going to be able to build that skill set. That's, that's super encouraging for sure. Yes. It's a skill set. Yeah. And people have to want to, to do it. You know, this is where I see when I have couples and one person in the relationship has lower empathy, if that person really wants to get better at it, I can absolutely help them do that and they absolutely can do it if they want to. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can only you can only help somebody if they're willing to help themselves is the old saying, isn't it? But it's it's so true for so it's many cliche, different things. But it's true. Yeah. Mm. I've mm-hmm. had a um if you think about that, I've had a boss before. Like he's probably my f- favorite boss I've ever worked for. And now that as you were talking before, I was thinking about him, like he, he, he wasn't the most, um, like if you, when you first meet him, he was quite cold. Like he was all about business, you know, let's get it done. But the more no. and more that I worked with him, he would have a real knack of seeing things and sort mm-hmm. of putting himself in my shoes. So like he would start the conversation with, Hey, I've been thinking about this and I'm, I'm guessing that you're probably feeling something like this. Is that, first of all, is that correct? And then that, that made such a huge difference, you know, because yeah. uh, 
instantly there was this connection where I was going, man, Chris really cares about me as a person, not just, I'm not just a number in this company. Yeah, that's, so I think that's really a good skill for business leaders, CEOs, anyone, or any leaders really, isn't it? 100%. I think it's one of the top skills. And yeah, I, I really like that story because it seems like very authentic empathy. You know, he's taken his time. He hasn't rushed in to sort of try and fix the problem straight away, which is mm. I want to talk at some point about the empathy killers, like the things that we accidentally do that can get in the way of empathy or, or kill it because that's a really important sort of like what is not empathy? What do we kind yeah. of, con- you, you know, we, we get confused between empathy and other things. And one of those things is we try and we rush in to try and solve problems and fix things. Mm, um, sure. And it's a classic boss behavior and it's a classic husband behavior sometimes as well, right? It's oh, like, <laughs> I think I did that this morning now that we're talking about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I do it too. Like, you know, with my kids, it's just like, here, let me, I'll do it. I'll fix it. You know, and I, and I catch myself and, and sometimes it's appropriate, but sometimes it really blocks the connection mm. that's possible, right? Yeah. And so your boss sounds like he, you know, he stood back. He observed, he tuned in, like he was trying to pick up on the feeling as well as what was happening. Mm. And then he came to you and said, and checked it out with you, you know, I'm guessing you're feeling this way or this is how you're affected and is that right? And he checked it out. You know, he was curious without being arrogant. Like mm. that's brilliant. Yeah, I think that. And the fact that he would go, this is what I think you're feeling, is that right? I he think that's it. a huge thing as well because otherwise – because there were times where he kind of wasn't right, you know, and I had to be like, oh, actually sort of, but if he had have just come sort of, even if he wasn't barging in, but took his time and then came in and was like, I know this is what you're feeling. And I wasn't actually feeling that way. Then kind of all that hard work that he may have just done kind mm-hmm. of doesn't mean much, mean much at all. Cause you're like, well, hang on, you're way off here. So I think that's, it's that careful consideration. It's almost like a strategy for it, really. It is a strategy. And, in fact, I've, um, if I can pull it up on my screen, my computer's being very laggy, but um, I had some tips for the listeners about, you know, things to do, you know, some practical tips if, if the time is right, Rich, for us to cover that. For sure. That's what I'm all about. I love I love talking about this stuff and then having some practical tips as well to to share and to use in my own life and to share with the listeners. So that sounds yes. awesome. Does it make sense? Would it make more sense to do to look at the empathy killers first and then the practical strategies for practicing empathy? Do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think so. That sounds right. Maybe we'll maybe we'll do the practical stuff sort of as we're as we're finishing up and leave leave people with that. Yeah, sure. Um, Now I'm trying to find my list of empathy killers. I might have to just do them off the top of my head. I do run a lot of workshops on nonviolent communication and compassionate communication, um, which people who are interested can can Google either of those terms, nonviolent communication or compassionate communication, um, because uh, it's it's a great body of work that really is practical empathy skills. Mm. Um, and they do talk about the empathy killers, um, in nonviolent communication. Um, and I had a list ready and now I'm trying to <laughs> find what I've done with it. It's always um, the way, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but I, I, that, that's okay. I'll just have to, um, I'll have to add lib, which I'm good at doing as well. So the, um, the empathy, empathy dampeners or empathy killers, the other things that block, emotional connection. Now these things aren't always bad. For example, sometimes we want a bit of sympathy. Um, I know sometimes I don't mind a bit of sympathy, but sometimes sympathy can block empathy. So, you know, when, you know, when we say to somebody, Oh, you poor thing, you know, that's classic sympathy. Yeah. We're sort of feeling for somebody, it can be quite isolating at times if we, you know, don't choose our timing. Um, to give somebody sympathy, um, you know, it's like I, I work with people sometimes who have chronic health problems or disabilities 
Now, if you're someone who, and if it's a recent health problem or a recent injury or disability, people can get quite sick of of the sympathy rather. You know, yes. you know, you have people say, I don't, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. You know how people say that? Definitely. Yeah. I've got a friend who's a occupational therapist. I think that's how you say yeah. it. Yeah. And um, same thing. She's working with clients over three to four years and they're just so sick of people sort of going, looking like showing them pity or sympathy and they're going, mm-hmm. I'm here trying to, get better at like trying to yeah. heal what don't give me sympathy give me stuff that's going to help me right you know? yeah and so in a situation like that i might even use the word compassion rather than empathy because compassion to me has a bit of a, a bit more of an active i feel i feel like it's a bit more of an active word you know mm. so saying to someone who's still struggling with chronic health issues is there anything i can do you know let me know if i can help you what mm. would be helpful to you um, that's normally what people in that situation would prefer, right? They don't want your pity. Yeah. But, sure. but, you know, like just to offer yourself up as to be of service if if they want it sort of thing. And it also conveys that it's a doing, it's all like a sort of a doing word, but it also conveys, okay, this person is feeling this towards you. You know, they, they are, they're with you on this, but not yeah. in just a, oh, you poor thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And because the, the prefix M means with, you know, the difference. Okay. I mean, I think sim means with as well, but I, I looked into the, the, the background of the, these words a long time ago because I was curious, like, why do they have different meanings? Um, but sympathy has this quality of looking, sort of looking down on someone a little bit, whereas empathy is really, I'm at the same level as you, you know, like we're both human. Is there anything I can do to help you? Clearly it conveys empathy. Um, but definitely has that active um, quality to it. So that's one empathy killer is sympathy. Another one is giving advice. Isn't that a classic one? Yep, guilty. Have you ever done, have you ever done that? <laughs> yeah, all the time. <laughs> Me too. And sometimes you sense that it's totally fine, you know, to give someone a bit of advice, you know, Oh, I'll tell you what worked for me. You know, when I was in that situation, this is what I did. And it was really helpful. And sometimes the other person goes, awesome. Thanks for telling me that. And other times it is just so not what they want. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I've had to learn that for sure. Cause I'm a big sort of, if you just learn the thing that's going to help you and put, take that on board, it's all going to be okay. So I, I'm getting better at it, but I previously would just be like, oh, you're going through this. Here's what I learned. I may, and it may not have been something that I personally dealt with, but I'm like, I heard this on a podcast. You should do this. And I was like, why is this person not responding to my text messages? Or and I had to, it was actually my wife kind of chatting about it. And she's like, stop offering advice. They don't need your advice. You know, they just want you to care about them. And, uh, yeah, yeah it's exactly. It's, it's so ironic because the things that we are so easily tempted to do, like educate someone like, oh, I heard, I read this great book or I heard this great podcast and they said, you should do this. And then we start giving advice or, the, or we give sympathy or we give what's another empathy block up, you know, or we tell people, no, that's not how it is. It's like this. Or we tell our own story, you know, say, oh, well, when that happened to me, <laughs> we start going into our own yeah storytelling or we minimize we say you know oh you know it could be worse it's not that bad um or we try and i'm guilty of all of these all of these i know (laughs) me too we try and or cheerleading is another empathy killer we try and you know tell people they're they're so they're the best and they're so amazing and i believe in you and you can do this again you know these kinds of um behaviors and communication strategies, if we can call them that, they're not always wrong or inappropriate. It's just we obviously need to be intuitive about when to use them because sometimes all the other person wants us to do is hold the space. Mm. You know, whether it's our partner, our child, our friend, our client, sometimes it's better to just hold the space for them for a bit longer and just listen and be genuinely curious about what they're feeling, what they're needing, 
what the world looks like through their eyes. If we just spend a bit longer doing that, normally we'll get a chance if they want it to offer some advice or cheer them up, encourage them, tell them, you know, I believe in you, you've got this. The problem is I think we rush too quickly to trying to help or fix or advise mm. or cheer up. You know, we, we rush to that too, too quickly. Um, this is a case where it's probably better to slow down most of the time and just hold off doing that a bit longer just to see whether it's warranted, just to sort of check it out. Mm. I, yeah. know, I know I overthink things as well. Like I've had some friends that have gone through some crazy, crazy struggles in their life. And um, I've, you know, you, you get that moment, say you've heard about what's happened and then there's that moment where you see each other. Leading up to that, there's times where I've been going, oh, okay, what am I going to say to this person who's my friend? And there's, I've shared this with my wife and gone, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to say. And she, her and her wisdom has gone, don't say anything. Like just turn up, just be there, give your mate a hug. And then if he wants to share, he'll share. And um, that's, that was really, it was still hard for me to do that. But I think that is a, is a big thing as well as this kind of overthinking and, you know, what you just said, rushing in when most of the time I just, it's holding that space and just going, here I am. Yes. I'm here with you. You can make the next within reason, like the next step is up to you sort of thing, you know? Mm. Yeah. It's really powerful. It's really powerful. And we can't talk about empathy, Rich, I don't think without talking about vulnerability because mm. the thing that is the simplest thing to do, which is just turning up, like you said, just being there and saying, you know, I'm here for you. Is there anything I can do? I'm here to listen. Just really simple, simple stuff like that. Often that's the hardest thing to do. Yeah. It's ironic, isn't it? The simplest thing is the hardest thing. And, and here's why. It's because of vulnerability, right? If you're sitting with someone in pain, you're witnessing their vulnerability, you know, they are scared or they are hurt or they are stuck and don't know what to do next, all of which are very vulnerable experiences. And then when we see that, we feel vulnerable. We feel vulnerable because we're not sure what to say or do. And even as a therapist, I am still regularly, regularly confronted in my job sitting across from a new client or a client who's just turned up and has had a really, you know, difficult thing happened to them. I have moments all the time of, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next <laughs> mm. and neither are they. And so for us to both be held in this really uncertain space, um, in, in this empathic presence and just kind of being okay with not having all the answers just now and not knowing what to do next right now, you know, it's a, you feel very exposed. I think you feel very vulnerable and for sure. And, and I think that's why we do these other things. We give advice, we try and fix it. We give them sympathy. We do all these other empathy killer things because we don't want to just sit there feeling so vulnerable. And yet I think that's such a sign of maturity mm. when we can, soothe our own stress response, our own desire to fix it, you know, and instead of rushing in or in some way defending, protecting ourselves against this vulnerability, just be vulnerable for a few minutes. Um, it's kind of as simple as that and as hard as that. <laughs> yeah, it's, as you said, it's one of the simplest things but the hardest things, but I, I think more and more, and especially in this, this day and age that we're in, and I'm sure it's been going on for all of history where we mm. kind of build up these walls and these personas of ourselves. When, when you are with somebody who you, you just feel that you are speaking to their, their real, it's really them, they're being vulnerable. There's so much power in that. And I think even it comes across sometimes, you know, on different, videos or things like this when you're seeing somebody's raw emotions and that you know that they're not putting up a wall you yeah. you feel like 
there's something that happens. Hey, it's that kind of, it's, it's what we talked about before. It's that you're feeling what they're feeling and you're experiencing that at the same time. Is that I've heard in, uh, I've got a few friends that are counselors and they talk about, is it transference? So when you're sitting there with a client, you are starting to feel what they're feeling. Is that correct? It's a really good question. I'm glad you've asked it. Um, because it's clarifying for me as well. I think there is a fine line between feeling what your client is feeling. So if I'm sitting with someone who's feeling really sad, naturally I feel a bit of sadness. Mm. That's natural empathy. That's affective empathy. When I start getting into some experience of distress because it's triggering something in me, from my life, either current or historical, then I start getting emotionally entangled. So transference yeah. is defined as emotional entanglement with the other person. Okay. So they're telling a story and that makes me think of something that happened to me because all therapists are human too. <laughs> and, and I start going into my own stuff rather than staying 100% present for the client. Now, mm. does this happen to therapists? Of course. Um, it's not a problem per se if we're aware that it's happening and we can just take a few breaths, park that for later and come back to being fully present for the person sitting in front of us. So there is a difference between compassion and transference um, for any any counselling students or psychology students listening, but it's a fine line and I guess it's the degree of distress, you know, like, I could be sitting with someone who's going through their childhood traumas or who's just lost their parent or their best friend. You know, I had a client whose best friend died suddenly not long ago. And so this is a quick story. So her best friend died. She's not much younger than me, my client. I have a best friend who I love so much. And I started imagining in that session, if that had been my best friend who died suddenly And I start getting tears in my eyes and probably Mm. my clients thinking I'm just feeling for her. (laughs) If she could see my eyes, I don't know. And I was, but there was a part of my mind thinking, how would that be if it was my friend? I had to go home and have a little cry just at the thought Mm. of my best friend dying in her sleep at the age Mm. of 40 or whatever. Um, Yeah. So um, that was sort of compassion that turned into a bit of transference, which I was able to pull back and, you know, and then deal with later. Yes. Yeah. It's It's kind of the ultimate like version of you putting yourself in that person's shoes, isn't it? Like it's, but it's the, the part where you go, okay, this is now it's another level. It's not just seeing it through their eyes. It's kind of feeling it through their eyes with your circumstances on top as well. So it would be tricky. It, it Well, energetically though, if you're very tuned in with your own body and your own feelings, which I am, cause I've had a lot of my own therapy. Um, and you can't really have a lot of empathy if you're not in touch with your own feelings, you know? So I think that's, we'll get to the practical stuff in a minute, but I couldn't energetically, I can feel where I'm going up into my head. I'm not as present. I'm not listening to her as well as I was. And I know that I'm not doing her. She might look at me and think, Oh, my psychologist is being so caring right now. She's got tears in her eyes. She probably (laughs) wouldn't know, but I can tell that I'm not listening to her properly anymore. So I'm not going to be, if I put myself in her shoes too much, I am not going to be of service to her. So imagining someone's experience too much that you start to over identify with it and imagine if it was you actually blocks, it ends up blocking empathy. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Cause you end up sort of putting up your own wall as well, because you're now, you're not just being present anymore. You're kind of. It's it's almost as if the energy that was focused out there starts to turn back to, you know, you become self-focused. Yeah. And empathy is by definition other focused unless you're talking about self empathy, which is just a genuine interest in your own feelings and needs to go back Mm. to my original definition. Um, and self empathy is so important. Um, 
but self-empathy is not really what I'm doing when I'm sitting with a client, <laughs> you know, my yeah. energy is focused on them. That's yeah. what they're paying for. So when I feel it start to turn back in myself, I have to, I have to change direction again. That's super, that's super interesting. So what are some practical thoughts then or not practical, practical things that we can do to increase our ability to show empathy? Yeah. Let's talk about that. Um, I will go back to my notes just so I, there's only a couple of things that I wanted to say about that. Um, first of all, well, I've kind of already said it, haven't I? First of all, I think we need to be able to regulate our own emotions and to regulate our own emotions, we have to be aware of our emotions and, mm -hmm. and having a very basic emotional vocabulary is helpful. Uh, even if we just have 10 words in our mental lexicon for what we're feeling, you know, scared, sad, disappointed, hurt, confused, anxious, frustrated, angry, satisfied, content, you know, like the, we can learn a dozen words that should cover a lot of situations, you know, but I've met people who can't even say, they can't even say to their partner, I'm really stressed right now. You know, like even that would be helpful just to, just to say I'm really stressed or I'm really upset, which are pretty vague words for emotions, but it's better than nothing, right? Because at least that, you're... Yeah. Sorry, is that just because they, they can't process what that emotion is? So they're going, I'm, I'm feeling all of this, but I don't know what it is. And so they usually, just... Yeah. Well, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. And usually it's because of emotional neglect in childhood. There's a whole body of work, if people are interested, called Childhood Emotional Neglect or CEN. Okay. People whose parents failed to tune in with their emotions when they were young and just help them put basic feelings into words. Um, the child gets the message that there's nobody in here worth getting to know. You know, my feelings don't matter. I don't... And they end up thinking they don't even have feelings. You know, I've had clients who say... I don't do emotions. I'm like, yeah. well, you do. You just don't realise that, you know, yeah. you're just not connected or, or, or aware. So the very first step, if people haven't even done this one, is to become more um, aware of their own emotions and have some words to, to put those feelings and emotions uh, into words um, because until we can do that, <clears throat> where, you know, we're not even going to recognise emotions as a thing. And so sometimes that does involve people, you know, doing some inner work, going to therapy, reading books, going to courses and, and thinking back on how they were raised and what messages they received about the value of emotions. Yeah. And, the, and in some families, anger was okay, but sadness wasn't. And in other families, anxiety was okay, but anger wasn't okay. You know, in different families, we received different messages and beliefs about different feelings. So that's worth reflecting on. Um, another thing that we can do to improve our empathy skills is using our imagination. And I think this is where the creative arts come in. I think this is where seeing um, films and reading books and trying to imagine the emotions of the characters in their various circumstances. Um, this is one part of empathy is using our imagination. I often say to clients, particularly couples, I say, can you imagine your partner's experience of this? Knowing mm. what you know about him, knowing what you know about his background, can you imagine, you know, knowing how you behave sometimes, can you imagine how this is for him? So already I've clicked that person into, oh, so maybe it's different. Now I have to use my imagination. Yeah. Get outside of your own head as much as you can by using imagination. And some people say I'm not very imaginative. Well, you know, we can work on that. Yeah, um, they're, all, they're all skills that we can work on, eh? Hey? Mm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We, we can improve our creativity and imagination for sure. So imagine what it's like to be someone else. Listening. Listening is another skill that's obviously a key one for empathy. And what happens, people often say they're really good listeners when they're pretty average listeners. <laughs> that's one of those funny things in psychology, you know, where like 80% of people say they're above average. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> above average drivers. I think it's something like 85% of people think that they're an above average listener. Mm. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> Which is pretty funny, right? <laughs> what, what gets in the way of listening often is defensiveness. So, you know, it mightn't be so hard to listen to our mate talk about, you know, the bust up that his cousin had with the next door neighbour or something, but it, when our partner is telling us that something we did really upset them, that's pretty hard to listen to because all mm. of our defences start rising and we want to defend and justify ourselves. Mm. So taking a few deep breaths, soothing our own stress responses, calming ourselves, listening a bit longer, just holding that space for the person even when we're feeling defensive and listening as intently and as genuinely as we can, trying to imagine the other person's experience again um, is obviously a big part of empathy and something we can get better at. For sure. That, that's something I've even, I'm constantly learning and getting better at, even with this podcast, for instance, is, you know, you're talking to different people about different topics and as they say things, I'm, um, you know, processing things in my own head, but I'm slowly learning to kind of park those and go, no, 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 I can come back to those. I can, I can watch this back later if I want to, and I can sort of process some of that stuff. But right now, how can I be as present as possible listening to you, for instance, and going, what is Rachel telling me? Where is this experience coming from? She obviously has a lot more experience and knowledge than I do in this. I'm here to learn and I constantly kind of think, thinking through those things, but holding them loosely at the same time, if that makes yeah. any sense. So that's a really just, nice way of saying it. Mm. And yeah. that's, it's something I've been terrible at in the past as my wife and friends will attest um, is kind of, if I had an opinion and somebody had an, a different opinion, I'm thinking straight away about, Oh, as soon as this person stops speaking, I've got the best sort of comeback for them. And I worked out there were so many times where I would do that comeback, but I'd realize that's not actually what they were talking about anyway. So it didn't make any sense. So learning to listen is so important. Hey, it is. And yeah. And it's something we can definitely get better at. I liked, um, you know, something you just said, I thought everybody, you, you know, you look at me and think I've got more experience, but everybody has more experience of being who they are than we do. Mm, <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, like nobody knows what you think and what you feel and what you need better than you do. So yeah. if, if you genuinely love somebody or care about them, whether it's um, a, a client or a partner or a child or a friend or a family member, you know, if you can connect with the fact that you genuinely care about this person, then you can be genuinely curious and imaginative. Like, what is it like to be this person? Not what is it like to be me? You know, I know what it's like to be me. But if I'm open and curious, like, what is it like to be rich? What is it like to be this person? What is it like? To, you know, you are the expert on yourself. And so mm. I'm always learning in my job. And I try, the mindset I try and cultivate when I walk into the room is what can this person teach me about what it's like to be them? Yes. And, and without me imposing onto them any of like any of my shoulds, you know, like they should feel this or they should react like this or this is how they should see it or should, because I do. Mm. Like that's yeah. a thing we do a lot, right? For sure, yeah. And, um, you know, so this, this is the last thing I was going to, I think this is the last thing I was going to say about practical skills and it's sort of, practical and esoteric at the same time. It's try and cultivate curiosity. You know, if I had one wish for how we could change the culture that we live in as a psychologist, it would be if we could put some drug in the water that made us all just a lot more curious about mm -hmm. other people's experiences um, and other people's feelings and needs because, you know, we're so judgmental in this culture sometimes, you know, like why would they do that and why would they, that guy do this and, and I guess my training as I've taken it in, into myself is, is not to judge but is to, is to be really curious and think there must be a reason. You know, mm. if someone's being aggressive or defensive or withdrawn and avoidant or whatever the behaviour is, like there must be a reason or a set of reasons why. 
And I'm curious about that. So I think cultivating curiosity, bringing as much curiosity to life and to relationships as possible is another really key practice or skill for empathy. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's something like I, I used to find myself getting really caught up in kind of, you know, I'd, I would watch too many things on YouTube about different political groups, especially in America, you know, there's the Republicans versus Democrats and the media just loves creating wars between them. Enemies. Oh, yeah. That, like that's what they, that's their business model pretty much. And um, I would find myself going, oh, why would this person why would they believe that? Like, what is, what is wrong with them? Or, and from both sides going, what's wrong with them? But then I started to adopt that mindset and it, I don't even know where it came from. It wasn't necessarily something that I learned where I went, okay, I need to do that. But I started thinking, going, this person is willing to stand outside of the white house to protest this. There must be a reason that they feel so strongly about that what is that reason and what are their experiences and then vice versa. And I think if, as you say, if we did that a lot more and kind of went, what, what is this person trying to teach me or what can I learn from this person? doesn't mean I have to agree with everything they say, but there would be a lot more harmony collaboration. I think we just get so much more stuff done and be a much happier nation or health happier world. Yeah we would have more empathy, you know. I mean, we've seen politicians like the New Zealand Prime Minister talk about empathy and in many people's view, and I I sit with not knowing because a lot of the time if I see a protester outside, you know, I think, well, I don't know why they're protesting exactly and I don't know enough. Like there's so many things actually, if we're honest, we just don't know, right? We've got to actually get comfortable with It's very vulnerable to admit we don't know stuff. But, in Mm. fact, we know very little. Um, it, you know, the, the older I get and the more I know, the more I realise that I know very little. So I think that um, keeps you humble and it keeps you curious as long as you're willing to sit with not knowing. Mm. But if, and if we sit with not knowing, then we cultivate more curiosity and that lays the foundations for more empathy and less judgment. Because um, empathy is almost the opposite of judgment as I, as I see it. So, yeah, I, I really wish we could have more politicians and business leaders who, who were high on curiosity and empathy and low on judgment and contempt. And, yeah, I think that I, I think it's going to happen. I just think it takes time. Definitely. I'm, I'm really conscious of the time and I, uh, I, I can see that we're getting close to our, our finishing time. We're pretty much about there. But I think we've pretty much covered really a lot of stuff in a short amount of time and I think it's, some really valuable insights and knowledge that you've shared that from myself and the listeners, we can kind of take away and go and almost at least do a check on ourselves and go, where are we at? Like, are we, are we going well with this? Are we going good with this? We've always got stuff to learn, but I think we can do that and then really start to put some of those into place. And I think it's super valuable what you said about what, what is not empathy because those are things that you can kind of catch yourself and go, well, hang on, I'm doing that right now. I should be doing this. So thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I've, uh, it's been great to meet you and, and learn from you today. And, yeah, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Rich. I'll maybe see you again sometime with, with another topic. For sure. Uh, before we go, where can people find you if, they're, if they need more information or they want to come and see you as a, as a client? Where's the best place? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So our, we have two offices on the north side of Brisbane, one in Aspley and uh, a few rooms in Aspley and also rooms in Stafford Heights in Brisbane. Uh, they could go to our Facebook page, which is North Brisbane Psychologists, or they could go to our website, which is northbrisbanepsychologists.com.au. We also have a YouTube channel and an Instagram account, so there's multiple ways to find us online. Awesome. Sounds good. So anybody listening, if that's what you're up to and that's what you think you need to go and do, definitely go and check out Rachel at those places and, you know, learn from her one on one. We have a team. There's nine psychologists in our team, so we often support couples and families with that sort of team-based approach. 
Awesome. Sounds good. Well, thanks so much. It's been great. And uh, everybody will see you in the next episode. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Rich. I'll talk to you soon.